judge came and ordered that the teachers be let out so that their cases could be heard. And unsurprisingly, uh, there, it was found that there was no justification for their arrest. And this is an example of two peacemakers on opposite corners of the world who very, very different conflict situations, very different contexts, uh, who use the same method, the same uh, peacemaking method. Chencho Alas in El Salvador is one of them, and the Reverend Benny Gie in West Papua, which is a territory of Indonesia, is another. Uh, Chencho, since 1995, has been working to create a zone of peace in the lower Lempo region of El Salvador. And this is an area, a region that he uh, defines as being committed to changing the culture of violence to one of collaboration and mutual problem solving and of peace. And in the meantime, thousands of miles away, Benny Gie has, has been promoting a similar concept of establishing a zone of peace in West Papua in which everyone says no to fighting and puts their guns down and creates a safe space for coming together and trying to resolve differences at a table as opposed to in the battlefield. In El Salvador, Chencho, in the process of creating and establishing support for this zone of peace, uh, created or, or uh, led multiple workshops with the uh, local community members to get their support and to get their ideas of what this zone of peace should look like. Uh, he, and, and what derived from these various workshops is a holistic vision that really touches on the concerns of the peasants of themselves. Uh, the, this zone of peace and the philosophy behind it encompasses uh, democratic participation, human rights, the need for a sustainable economic development, the need for a sustainable environment, all the values that resonated with the community members themselves that they wanted to see implemented in this zone of peace. In exactly the same way, Benny Gie in West Papua would hold seminars, uh, workshops for local Papuans to see what this zone of peace should look like. And his whole philosophy as a religious leader is that although the church has, is very active, has been very active in West Papua, and there have been uh, uh, there are many missionary um, schools and universities that have opened up. The uh, churches really do need to be led by the indigenous population. They need to be, make sense to the people on the ground living it day to day. So he was also through these seminars and these workshops able to come up with a philosophy of nonviolence that really incorporates the indigenous understandings of spirituality and the environment and the importance of earth and peace and safety and justice, as well as the teachings of Christianity that also resonated very much with the community members. And these were both blended into a philosophy that he promotes today, but unfortunately has been banned in many instances by the Indonesian government. But he's still very involved in writing and researching and working toward creating this zone of peace in West Papua. So this is just very quick, quickly some of uh, a few of the examples uh, featured in our book, some of their uh, lessons from their stories. And really our, the message that we hope to, 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 to bring out from this book is that religion is a resource that can be used positively in resolving conflict. And religious peacemakers have many answers for us if we choose to listen to them, if we choose to pay attention to them. And our book is a resource that we hope will be used and is really, for us at the Tannenbaum Center, just a first step in this process of, of getting the word out there about religious peacemaking and the effect that it can have. We know that uh, a vocation of religious peacemaking requires attention, it requires training, it requires support. These are some of the things that we're able to provide this select group of 24 religious peacemakers that we work with, but certainly there are hundreds upon thousands of individuals all over the world doing very similar work, having similar type of impact in their communities, and they also deserve support and recognition and the training and, and the resources that they need. So we are now actually working with 
uh, some seminaries and some programs at universities and international affairs and conflict resolution and what a program on religious peacemaking will look like. And we know it's going to be very interdisciplinary as I mentioned before because the work that these individuals do is very interdisciplinary. They're bringing knowledge and skills from a variety of different areas of their lives and from their communities. And so we're, we're working with these, we will be working with these uh, seminaries and university programs to create trainings and eventually hopefully actually create something that would be like a major in religious peacemaking that someone can study this and then go out and have the, the skills and resources they need to do similar type of work if they choose. But also uh, we believe that seminarians whether they want to actually go and be involved in an area of armed conflict or whether they want to stay in their own community still need these skills because as religious leaders they are oftentimes uh, asked to um, address uh, situations of conflict in their community and so these skills are very important for them. And so this volume uh, really provides us uh, with a road map and these uh, peacemakers provide us with a road map if we choose to follow it and we very much hope that people do. Uh, and so now uh, we've, we've been uh, starting to work also with diplomats and policy makers and, and government officials uh, to also let them know about this incredible resource at their fingertips if they choose to use it, that they can pull uh, these religious peacemakers and work with them as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Once they become a member, they have access to each other. Uh, one thing that they have said over and over is that they feel so isolated in the work that they're doing because, again, as I mentioned, sometimes, in some cases, their religious institutions don't support the work that they do. They would much rather have them, you know, just very peacefully leading a sermon or, or whatever, but uh, so they're, they're not very happy with their activism. So to be able to meet other religious peacemakers doing similar work in very different contexts, coming from different religious beliefs, has been a huge source of support and um, has been a great advantage for them. I, I detect note of the subversive. I'm sorry. Well, they're not recognized by their official bodies, and so you uh, you recognize them. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some cases, and some of them have the full support of their. Oh, I see. Right, yeah, but, but some of them don't. And, that's, and so that's why we focus on religious individuals, because whether or not they have the support of their institutions, they are doing such important work and they do deserve that recognition. And how do you hear about them? How are they brought through, uh, through this nomination process. So every year we try to expand the pool larger and larger to get a, a, a more diverse pool. Uh, we send out information about you know, nominations, we've identified about a thousand um, organizations and individuals around the world who we think, you know, may know of peacemakers in their communities um, who could be, you know, who could, who could join this. Uh, so we send them information every year, collect their nominations, and then we try to do as much additional research as we can, which is very difficult because they are unrecognized. So it's not like they have extensive you know, articles uh, when you Google them. Um, sometimes nothing shows up when you Google them. So, uh, but you know, we try to gather as much information as we can so we can make it as much of an informed decision as we can. Yeah. I was curious about the uh, case study process. Mm -hmm. How did you, um, how did your organization conduct the case study process? Well, for this book, the, the case studies that have become the chapters of this book, it's been really a process that's taken over four years. Uh, in the beginning, when the program had just started, uh, Tanamom Center knew that they wanted to publish something about their work to get, the, to get the information out there. Not just have a few articles here and there, but really have something a bit more substantial. So they started doing some research and they had a few interviews. And then it evolved, because once we got to learn more about them, we're like, this is incredible. This information needs to be out there and so their case studies grew, the research behind it grew and now each of the case studies uh, in order to make it to, to be even more academically relevant in the beginning of each chapter there's a section that really places their work in context. It talks about the country, uh, the region, the conflict situation, whether or not religion is playing a role and then it gets into 
their work. Uh, so that's now the model that we're following. So future case studies of the peacemakers who have just been awarded, who are not yet, who are not featured in this book, will have a similar process where there's going to be, um, you know, putting their work in context, 